The advancement of technology and electronics has brought forth many helpful tools and devices throughout our recorded history. First, there was electricity itself, researched and studied by Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century. Then came the locomotive in 1804, redefining travel and mass transport. By the mid-19th century, the electric telegraph and long-distance communication was up and running. Fast forward to today, and everywhere we look, electricity surrounds us. Channeled through the phones we carry and the televisions we watch, most of our world's communications, travel industries and defence systems are all run via technology and an electricity grid. It's safe to say that without electricity, society would no longer be able to function, as we've grown to rely on it to a dangerous degree. It's why the threat of a geomagnetic storm erupting from the sun eats away at the minds of astronomers every single day, and why the idea of the 1859 Carrington event happening today spells certain doom and destruction all across planet Earth. The first sign that something was amiss in the first few hours of September 1859 came from the observations of amateur astronomers Richard Christopher Carrington and Richard Hodgson, who recorded observations of a solar flare just before noon on September 1st. Meanwhile, a few days earlier, 92 million miles away, a major coronal mass ejection was taking place on our local sun. A coronal mass ejection, also called a CME, is the voluminous release of plasma and its magnetic field into solar winds from the sun's corona. While CMEs are not 100% certain to be connected with solar flares, the geomagnetic storms that follow are undoubtedly the work of CMEs. Magnetic storms occur when the magnetosphere on Earth is disrupted by a cloud of magnetic fields, most often being that of the shock from solar winds. Coronal mass ejections usually need a few days to travel from the Sun's corona to Earth, but the one in 1859 took just 17.6 hours. Scholars now believe this was due to a lesser CME occurring, just prior to the one that triggered the Carrington event. Evidence of such can be found in records documenting an aurora event from three days prior, on the 29th of August. Had a smaller CME actually taken place then, Ambient plasma from new solar winds would have had a cleared path to reach Earth at much higher speeds, according to Sten F. Oldenwald and James L. Green in The Scientific American. Nevertheless, the Carrington CME erupted with a geomagnetic storm with an estimated peak power of minus 1.75 Teslas, uncommonly strong for Earth-impacted solar flares. Later on September 1st, a magnetic crochet was officially documented by Balfour Stewarts, a Scottish physicist working the magnetometer out of the Kew Observatory in Richmond, London. He returned the following day, this time observing a geomagnetic storm. Throughout September 2nd, the most obvious effects of the Carrington event took hold of the astronomical community's attention. Never before had they seen such wild activity proliferate across the world, and never would they see it happen again. In full transparency, the Carrington event of 1859 wasn't all terror and pandemonium. One of the more drastic features of the CME and its geomagnetic storm was the aurora display seen from every corner on Earth. Aurora polaris is the light arrangement in the night sky, usually seen in areas with high latitude, such as the Arctic regions of Earth. They are formed by solar wind events impacting Earth's magnetosphere, as charged particles change direction through the magnetic plasma. These electrons then ionize, and the result is the beautiful sheets of translucent color seen on both polar ends of the Earth, as well as most planets in the solar system, including moons and other substellar objects, such as brown dwarfs. It would be to no one's surprise that the aurora display on September 2nd, 1859, was like no other. Almost the entirety of the Northern Hemisphere received some sort of snapshot of the auroras, including southern regions such as the Caribbean, Cuba, Mexico, and Hawaii, whose inhabitants would have been shocked at such an unlikely happening. One of the most bewildering effects of the auroras 
came in the Rocky Mountain region of the United States. In the very early hours of Friday morning on September 2nd, the auroras produced so much light that gold miners who had been camping in the hills woke up to their brilliance. In fact, the glow was so bright and illuminating that the miners simply assumed the day had broken and prepared breakfast, thinking it was waking hours. When they walked outside to head to the mines, they realized it was still night and the bands of Aurora Polaris made their jaws drop agape. Similarly, on the northeast coast of America, folks were waking up to the harsh lights of the auroras and starting their daily routine. Some realized quickly that the lights were neither the moon nor sun and marveled at their appearance. When they understood the auroras weren't going away anytime soon, they decided to start their day early and could sit out on their porches and read the newspaper by the pure light of the Carrington display. While there are no photos of the 1859 event in existence, a beautiful portrait that best sums up the sheer wonder of the auroras was published in the Baltimore American and Commercial Advertiser on September 3rd. An excerpt reads as follows. The light appeared to cover the whole firmament, apparently like a luminous cloud, through which the stars of the larger magnitude indistinctly shone. The light was greater than that of the moon at its full, but had an indescribable softness and delicacy that seemed to envelope everything upon which it rested. The single most fascinating aspect to the Carrington event's endless auroras is to think about how millions of people across the globe woke up and experienced something they had never seen before and probably wouldn't have ever seen had it not occurred. They were probably folks who woke up and were so startled by what they were seeing, they believed they had died overnight and woken up in heaven. Others probably woke up and found meaning in the miraculous light show, changing their ways and living a new life full of promise and hope. These are the more underrated aspects to the events of early September 1859 and are sadly overshadowed by the negative effects it brought upon the world and how that might be implicated in a future solar storm scenario. If there was a sliver of good news regarding the timing of the Carrington event, it's that it happened in an era when computers and cars and survival on electricity weren't even in the realm of possibility yet. The biggest worldwide communication system people had at the time was telegraphy, the transmission of letters and other messages using code, rather than the transfer of physical written media. A more streamlined version of telegraphy came in the 18th century, when the French inventor Claude Schapp popularized the use of an optical telegraph. Optical telegraphy was the usage of towers that conveyed messages and other information via visual signals, like light panels or semaphore indicator arms. Soon after, electrical telegraphs were introduced, most notably beginning in the 1840s, when the railway system in America was taking the country by storm. Samuel Morse followed up the invention with the creation of a single wire telegraph system, complete with a language now famously known as Morse code. It did not take long for electrical telegraphy to become the dominating mode of communication. By 1859, it was used beyond just railway signalling, and there were telegraph poles connecting the East Coast to most of the Southwest United States. Thus, at least in America, the Carrington event had quite the effect on communications and comm workers on September 2nd, 1859. Both in Europe and in the United States, mass failures across any electric telegraph system were happening, much to the surprise of the workers. In some cases, the geomagnetic storm sweeping the Earth's airwaves had physical consequences. There were reports of telegraph operators experiencing electric shock from impacted currents along the telegraph poles. Telegraph pylons saw a fire spray of sparks being thrown across open areas as well, increasing the danger of wildfires in especially dry geographies. People also had to evacuate buildings that were constructed near these sparking pylons due to a lack of fireproofing in many structures and the unpredictability of a flash fire. Some telegraph lines were so saturated with electricity, operators were still able to deliver or receive messages despite power supply failures, with leftover energy running through the amps and currents remaining in volatile, responsive conditions. Luckily for the world, it was 1859 and the loss of telegraphy in certain areas of Europe and North America didn't initiate much of a threat on people's survival. Supply chains may have been negatively impacted, 
and there may have been lingering anxieties over railway operations and mass transit. But for the most part, the small electrical grids that did exist went back online and nearly everyone was able to recover. Fast forward 163 years, and the world's power supply and power usage in total is much different now than it was back then, making the scenario of a Carrington-like event happening in 2022 so much scarier than it was in 1859. The first domino to fall in a modern-day Carrington situation is the collapse of most radio communications across Earth. While radio wouldn't cease to exist, it would become an absolute headache for anyone and everyone still using radio to work or survive. Radio communications would scramble as a result of high-energy sunlight ionising our upper atmosphere with influxes of X-ray and ultraviolet light. The second domino that would tumble is much more deadly and that's the livelihood of any unprotected astronauts working above Earth's surface. A radiation storm would sweep through the atmosphere as well, putting the men and women active in space in harm's way. Luckily, with our technology and predictive models, protecting astronauts from an incoming storm is much more plausible today, as long as there's enough reaction time between the solar flare and the radiation downpour. The third and final domino falls in the form of the ultimate coronal mass ejection, that would inevitably hit the planet a few hours later. The CME would take down many technologies, with satellites being the most vulnerable. Connected with satellites are the global positioning systems, known colloquially as GPS. Without GPS capabilities, so many people would be stuck without direction or coordination. Aeroplanes that rely solely on GPS function would enter a state of peril and our cell phones would no longer be able to be tracked or tell us where to go. Another, lesser known casualty to the loss of satellite function are payment systems such as credit cards. Every time you swipe your credit card, you ping a satellite somewhere above Earth's surface. Imagine how chaotic it would be to lose the ability to pay for services. As cashless business is becoming more and more prevalent in this day and age, entire grocery and department stores would shut down making basic purchases a nightmare for both companies and consumers. The biggest fear dominating the minds of doomsday experts is the potential loss of power across electric grids throughout the world. Solar particles that force power surges are strong enough to blow out even the largest transformers, which are hard to replace, let alone hundreds at a time. This would pose a significant problem in the eastern United States, where energy infrastructures are all closely interconnected. If one system were to go down, many systems would fail. This is especially troubling in small municipalities where the resources to quickly restore power are not available. The people in the most jeopardy are those in poorer communities. They already are dealing with food insecurities and housing shortages. Imagine power losses of more than a few weeks during the winter months when many places rely on electricity for heat. There would be so much loss of life purely because people couldn't find warmth or purchase the means to survive. Even large cities could lose power for up to a year. This would of course result in millions of deaths and trillions of dollars in damages. The recovery would take longer than the event itself, with entire infrastructures needing to be replenished. Not to mention the increase in crime, violence and vigilantism due to the lack of viable resources for the masses. It's hard to imagine a world covered in such darkness, both literally and metaphorically. But for many of us, that would become the norm if an event like the Carrington CME in 1859 occurred tomorrow. Obviously, there is no way to prevent solar flares from happening. The sun is a beast of otherworldly power, harboured 93 million miles away. It's a fool's errand to try and concoct a plan to stop CMEs from occurring at all. However, there are things we can do to make sure the effects of another geomagnetic storm the size of Carrington doesn't have such a chaotic and gloomy impact on our day-to-day -day lives. One such initiative would be to replace aging power grids in areas that are highly interconnected, like the eastern half of the United States. Adding sources to electrical systems that absorb runoff electricity would help surges caused by CMEs. 
there would be fewer blown transformers and smaller communities would have a greater chance at recovering faster. Federal agencies in democratic nations could also bulk up their mobile power transformer reserves. Reserves that could quickly be dispatched through non-electrical means to areas that need replacement systems. Additionally, experts have suggested satellites be built with safe modes, a layman's term for a dormant status taken by a satellite to avoid a power surge and deactivation. If certain satellites are saved, payment systems and cellular devices wouldn't be completely doomed. At the end of the day, humans have to reconcile with the fact that we've become so reliant on technology, electricity and digital communication, a solar storm could be the doomsday scenario of all doomsday scenarios. The good news is that there are steps to take to make sure it doesn't end human civilization altogether. Make a plan for yourself in the case of another Carrington 1859 and be prepared for when the inevitable does strike Earth once again. Thank you for joining us for this week's video on Axis Astronomy. We hope to see you here next week. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell in order to not miss a video. And don't forget to look up at the night sky and make a wish on a shooting star.